Uh, good evening. Thank you to those of you that have already logged on early. And I apologise, but there's been a little bit of mix up of time. And both our panellists have early engagements tomorrow morning. So we will start proper at 6 p.m. But I am recording this session throughout and have already pressed record. So what I will do is leap to a couple of the questions before six o'clock and then I will start the webinar proper at six. So um, Chris and Aziz, I won't introduce you at this stage. I'll simply ask some, the, the, a couple of the questions. The first one of which is how important is the role of women in the polio vaccination campaign in Afghanistan and Pakistan? So Aziz, do you want to start on that? Well, you know, the role of women in Pakistan has been very important because since we introduced community-based women in the vaccinators in the program and we recruited them on monthly basis, the program has seen a significant change in all the high risk areas. Now, all the high risk areas of Pakistan are covered by the CBVs, and Karachi was huge, very big, 22 million. So, half of Karachi was covered by CBVs, but now WHO and our partners, UNICEF, have decided to cover whole of Karachi with CBVs. The training process and recruitment has started. And we hope that the gaps which are presently existing in Karachi will be taken care of by that. So we feel that the role of women in Pakistan has been significant and the last CBV who was killed, Sakina, in Quetta with her daughter in the month of January this year, she was only 35 years old and she was targeted and killed. So we are sorry for the family and uh, we acknowledge the role of women in polio eradication efforts in Pakistan. Chris, can you uh, say for Afghanistan? Yeah, thanks, Aziz. Yeah, I, I'm, I think you're absolutely right about the impact in Pakistan of having the female vaccinators. I think that's made a huge difference to our access to uh, inside household compounds so that that um, house to house vaccinators can actually get inside the compound mm -hmm. and, uh, and and look for children actively inside the, the house. Um, in Afghanistan, we've struggled a lot to increase the number of women vaccinators. It's been a lot more, uh, it's a lot slower there, I would say, in, in terms of making progress in uh, in having higher levels of, of involvement of women vaccinators. In some areas, we're doing quite well. In the, in the central region of Afghanistan and Kabul in particular, and in the east, um, we have reasonable levels of, of participation of women vaccinators and women supervisors of vaccinators. But in some other areas, uh, like the south, where things are very, very traditional, it's uh, it's been a lot more difficult for us to recruit uh, women and have them accepted uh, easily um, moving house to house in, in within communities. I think we've just got time for one more question. And the one that I would like to ask is from Ray. And that's how long after eradication do we have to keep vaccinating? Because he thinks a lot of Rotary members believe the project will finish at that point, yet he thinks we will still have to keep vaccinating. Um, Chris, shall, I, shall I have got that one? Yeah, Chris, <laughs> Thanks, you, you take that shot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Janine, I, I think that immunisation will have to continue for some time after eradication. I mean, first of all, we have, um, you know, you, you know, we have a three-year uh, period between the last detection of wild poliovirus and the final uh, certification of eradication globally. So at least three years from when we finally stop transmission to when we can actually certify. And immunization will continue throughout that period because uh, no one, of course, will be confident that, that it's gone until the global certification process is finished. Then we, the plan is to go through a process of withdrawing the oral vaccine, the vaccine that we've been using primarily to eradicate polio. Um, because that's a live virus vaccine. And once wild virus is gone, the only real poliovirus, live poliovirus around would be that vaccine poliovirus. So ultimately, we want to stop using that if we can. Uh, once, so once we've removed that, uh, then we'll have to continue using the injectable vaccine for a period of time until everyone is confident that there's no problem to be encountered once we've once we've stopped using the oral vaccine in other words that once we're confident that no no virus is mutating and, and returning to wild type behavior so I, I would imagine that it will be some time after the end of certification that polio vaccination will still be taking place uh, in in one form or another and I, I would I would say it will be somewhere between um, five and 15 years after eradication that that vaccination will still be continued. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> OK, uh, we've now passed the six o'clock official start. And if I could uh, take us back to the beginning, apologies to those of us. Uh, sorry, those of you who have only just joined us. We had an issue with time. Uh, for both Chris and Aziz as they have a very early start tomorrow. So what we did was we started a few minutes early and have put a couple of questions to them, which will be recorded, um, or, or the whole session is being recorded, so you will have a chance to catch up on those questions, but there's still plenty of things to discuss. So I'd now like to start the uh, webinar uh, formally, please, by welcoming you all. And as I have said, it is being recorded and will be available online shortly, both within Rotary in Great Britain and Ireland and more generally to the wider public, including on the Global Polio Eradication Initiatives website. I won't be giving your contact details to anyone, although I will mention your Christian name when I put your questions to the panellists. My name is Janine Bertwistle and I'm the Rotary GBI polio champion, that's Great Britain and Ireland polio champion, and I'll be chairing the discussions. And I'm delighted to welcome our panellists, Chris and Aziz, whom I will introduce individually in a moment. They'll be speaking for a short time with Chris focusing on Afghanistan generally and World Health Organization, i.e. WHO, related matters for both countries. And Aziz will cover Pakistan and Rotary related matters for them both. And between them, I'm sure they will be giving us information about any joint work between the two countries. Once we've heard from them, I will then open it up for more questions. And I have already had several in advance. If you want to ask a question, you should have a tab on your GoToWebinar panel about questions. And that's where you need to type your question in. I will uh, try to get all the questions to the panellists, but if we don't have time, I will make sure that I follow up with you afterwards anyway. We will be finished by 7pm at the very latest, uh, but uh, possibly earlier. I will also be asking you to answer a couple of quick polls during the session and making a couple of handouts available to you before we finish. So, Chris, if we can start with you, I'd just like to... Uh, say a couple of things about you from what I have read. Um, you've been working, as I understand, with the WHO since 1993 on immunisation and polio and joined the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, of which Rotary is one of the spearhead partners at the WHO in the year 2000. You've been involved in polio eradication at every level from organising local vaccination campaigns to investigating cases of paralysis 
and running technical elements of the global program. You currently manage the erad polio eradication program for 22 countries, making up the Eastern Mediterranean region, including Pakistan and Afghanistan and the outbreak countries of, in the Horn of Africa and the Middle East. I'd like to actually just congratulate you, Chris, on your recent uh, honour with the Order of Australia for your distinguished service, and I shall read this out, to the community and international public health through technical, operational and management roles in the global eradication of polio. So I think we're uh, delighted to have you with us, Chris, and over to you, please. Thank you very much, Janine. Um, I very much appreciate the congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's always nice to get uh, to get some recognition from your own people. I have to say, it's uh, very very um, gratifying. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. My current role is to is to be managing WHO's polio eradication pro program for the Eastern Mediterranean region, and that includes. Uh, the last two wild polio virus endemic countries in the world, Pakistan and Afghanistan. They're, they're the last two countries that are reporting uh, wild polio virus. It also includes countries in the Middle East and the Horn of Africa, as you say, that have suffered uh, in the past few years uh, from outbreaks due to wild polio virus, but also from outbreaks of uh, vaccine-derived polio virus. That's, uh, that's viruses that have developed or mutated from the oral poliovirus vaccine, um, type 2 viruses in particular. Um, so it's a it's an interesting part of the world to work in, as I'm sure as Aziz, Aziz will confirm as well when when uh, he speaks. At the moment we are in we are in pretty good shape. We have a situation so far this year where we've had a total of 10 cases of polio reported. Eight of them have been reported from Afghanistan and two from Pakistan. Uh, both countries are using uh, um, quite advanced and, and aggressive uh, immunization strategies and approaches to try to interrupt poliovirus transmission. In the, the situation in both countries, as, as I know that many of our listeners are, are aware, is quite complicated. Um, in Pakistan uh, is a, a very large and, and complex country, uh, a very large population. And as was pointed out to us today here in Islamabad by some of our colleagues in the Pakistan program, um, in Karachi, it has the largest urban conglomeration in, in South Asia. So it's, it's no easy uh, place in which to eradicate a communicable disease. And Afghanistan, of course, uh, is, is suffering from a complex emergency situation with a great deal of conflict and insecurity and issues of, of um, control of, uh, of geographical areas by different uh, political groups. Um, that so same sort of complex emergency situation is also a factor in the Middle East and in, in uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, but in, in both of those settings, we have been able to successfully respond to wild poliovirus outbreaks in the recent past. Uh, through a great deal of effort and a tremendous amount of courage on behalf of the, on, on the part of the local um, vaccinators and, and, and medical staff who were working on the uh, uh, on the responses. So the situation generally is very positive. I think we're we're feeling very uh, uh, very upbeat about the possibility of finishing polio uh, in the in the relatively near future. Um, I think the the time frame that both Pakistan and Afghanistan would like like to put on it. They would both like to eradicate during this calendar year if they could. Um, I think probably a more realistic time frame is, is about 12 months because that takes us through to the next low transmission season for poliovirus, which is a, a much uh, easier period to finish the job off. Uh, but as I said, in general, very, very positive feeling. And I, I think that um, uh, I'm remain quite confident that the two programs, despite all the difficulties that they face, are, are capable of finishing this job and finally reading the word of polio. I'll hand it back to you, Ginny. Thank you very much, Chris. So, so much information in, in such a short time. Um, 
I'm pleased the session's recorded. I'd like to now hand straight over to Aziz, please. And in relation to Aziz, um, not only is he the chair of the National Polio Plus Committee in Pakistan, he's a member of the International Polio Plus Committee and also the Endowment and Major Gift Advisor for his zone 6B, which is, um, for those who don't know, that's a, a role in helping to get funding, major gift funding and endowments in for our Rotary Foundation. The awards Aziz has received within Rotary and beyond include the most prestigious Pride of Performance Award from the Government of Pakistan for his humanitarian and community services, <coughs> excuse me, the Louis Pasteur Medal by the French Pasteur Institute, the International Service Award for a Polio Free World, and the Service Above Self Award. Some of you may recall that polio was almost eradicated from Pakistan back in 2012, when the Taliban who controlled northern and southern Waziristan imposed an embargo on oral polio vaccine, which resulted in half a million children being trapped without the vaccine and led to over 300 polio cases in 2015. Aziz himself negotiated the agreement with them, which changed the tide and the number of polio cases once again has dropped. To, and today the progress is evident with the number of cases the lowest in history. So as is, over to you, please. Thank you, thank you. I think that Chris has given a very realistic introduction on part of Rotary. It's just, just not the Rotarians in Pakistan, 4,000, 1.2 million plus Rotarians worldwide are with us. Some are generating funds. Some are working. So we all are eagerly looking forward to eradicating this disease, crippling disease from the face of this world. Rotary made this commitment in 1980s when we started the program in Philippines. We will be talking a lot on eradication of polio when we meet later this month in Toronto, Canada, and we will be having an IPPC meeting also there in which we will be considering the grants of WHO and UNICEF. Rotary has committed to support the efforts of polio eradication till the end. We, as Chris said, that we are hopeful that we will be able to stop transmission in Pakistan and Afghanistan in very near future. And after that, we go through the certification period of three years, but we will remain alert for some time because the virus is very resilient and we want to make sure that it is gone once and forever. Eradication of smallpox was different and eradication of polio is a different game. We have challenges. We have security issues both in Pakistan and Afghanistan. When our vaccinators move in the high-risk areas, they move under protection of security or army personnel because we do not want to lose any more vaccinators. We have sacrificed quite a many and we will never forget the life lost for a noble cause. 
So I can assure the Rotarians of Great Britain that the Rotarians in Pakistan and in Afghanistan are fully determined to bring an end to polio transmission. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz, and, and thank you for mentioning the sad fact that lives have been lost by vaccinators and their support, and indeed, we must recognise that throughout. Before I move to the questions, I'd just like you um, attendees, please, if you wouldn't mind just answering a quick poll. I'm only going to give you a few um, seconds to do so. But if you have a look here, I'd be very interested to know how often you actually update yourself on developments in the fight to end polio. So if you wouldn't mind just answering that very quick poll, I would appreciate it, please. We're nearly there. OK, I'm going to close it there. So that's interesting. So the majority are monthly, as you can see. And good to see that it's never. There are zero of you that look at it never. But I guess the people that are actually taking the time to take part tonight are actually interested in the fight to end polio. So thank you for that. Um, and I have one more quick poll, please. And I, again, it relates to that information. What sources of information do you use? So if you could just answer on that. And uh, for those of you that actually put other, if you could take the time to email me at some point with what other is, I would be grateful. So I'm just going to give that a few more seconds. OK, I'm going to close that poll. And I'm going to share the results with you there. So it's a, quite a mix there. And I look forward to seeing what the other is. I would recommend all three of those first websites to you. They all do have very good information. The most up to date is always the Global Polio Eradication Initiative's own website. And there's lots of very clearly presented information. There's lots of videos, short videos, presentations, etc. And I'd highly recommend those. So, I'd now like to open uh, the session to questions and the two that have already been asked, I'm not going to, to go back to again, uh, but uh, they will be available on the recording. So the first was in relation to the role of women in the vaccination campaign in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the other was about the problems posed by Islamic extremist groups. So the question I'd like to raise first is one that was raised by Reg, who unfortunately has not been able to join us this evening, but I think this is an important question and relates to the extent of environmental surveillance in Pakistan and even perhaps in the border area with Afghanistan. I'd actually, actually widen that question to environmental surveillance in Afghanistan too. Obviously, environmental surveillance is such an important part of the campaign now. Um, so could um, Chris, could I turn to you first, please, for your thoughts about environmental surveillance? Yes, sure, Janine. It, between the two countries, we've now got approximately 80 uh, environmental surveillance sites. And the network is, is very well developed in Pakistan, and I would say still quite well developed also in Afghanistan. Um, all of the provinces are covered. Uh, all of the major um, 
cities and areas of, of known uh, previous um, poliovirus circulation, particularly those areas that we consider to be core reservoirs for polio, are very well covered. So um, it's a fairly extensive network. The uh, Afghanistan network is a little bit more restricted. It's less. It's less. Uh, uh, it covers less well the, the areas in the north of the country that have traditionally not been endemic for polio, although there are a couple of sites up there. Uh, most of the sites concentrate on the, on the southern and eastern parts of the country that uh, have traditionally been endemic for polio and, of course, are part of this common uh, transmission zone with, uh, with Pakistan because the, the populations on each side of the border are, are quite closely related and there's a lot of um, uh, social and economic movement between, between the two countries. So env the environmental surveillance we have now we think is extremely important. It's become a, a very um, significant uh, piece of information for us when we're looking at, at what's going on with viral transmission and what's happening with the genetics of the virus. And it's a very, very solid uh, support to, to the AFP surveillance data, the surveillance for, for uh, paralysis in, in children that, that is the main um, surveillance mechanism for polio eradication. Thank you, Chris. Is there anything you want to add, Aziz? Uh, no, I would just endorse what Chris has said. And uh, add one more thing, you know, like if in Pakistan today we have 55 seven sites, when India became polio free at that time, if you look at the size of India, five times that of Pakistan, they had 12. So we have such a robust system that nothing can be missed out. We can assure you. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz. That that does actually lead me slightly more, um, Chris, for no-go areas for environmental surveillance. Are there any? It's more of an issue that there's there's no-go areas for um, for surveillance of uh, of um, children with paralysis. Actually, Janine, the the issues for for environmental surveillance are much more much more related to just the uh, you know the technical utility of it i suppose put it that way because it's a very insensitive tool you know you 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 you're just you're getting a very a very broad snapshot of what's going on that doesn't really allow you to to uh, understand who the virus is transmitting in or how many children are, are being infected or any of those things. It's just basically, if there is any virus circulating in a community, you will pick it up through environmental surveillance. The other element to it though, is that you, you've got to have an environmental surveillance site that makes sense. Uh, otherwise it doesn't really tell you anything. If, if you get a you know persistently negative um, environmental uh, samples, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no virus around if if the site is not is not an appropriate site to be draining a big enough population and the right population group that you really want to know about. So so it's not so much that you, we can't get into areas with environmental uh, surveillance. It's it's much more that it's critical to find the appropriate area to set up environmental surveillance where it really will give you useful information. Um, it's it's the the bigger issue for access to areas, you know, security access or uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, to to areas, particularly areas in in conflict or areas that are that are that are very uh, have very complex uh, security situations, is for surveillance for paralysed kids because that's really the basis of of surveillance for polio virus. Um, and and if you have you know if we have that basic surveillance mechanism operating even in a security compromised area, we can feel much more confident about the situation than than if we don't have that sort of system operating. I mean, uh, if you if you don't know whether kids are being paralysed or not, it's very very it's a very uncomfortable feeling, believe me. <laughs> but in most places in the region, in most places in the region, I would say, even the conflict affected areas, we have effective functioning AFP surveillance systems. So uh, largely, 
while, you know, while we never relax about it, largely we, we feel that we have an understanding of what's going on with uh, poliovirus dynamics. Thank you, Chris. I mean, with AFP or acute flaccid paralysis, um, there is actually a high number of cases of that that do have to be investigated that aren't polio at all. Is that right? Absolutely, especially now, because now the proportion of cases that are actually polio is 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 tiny. So in every country except Pakistan and Afghanistan, it's it's zero at the moment. So all of the paralysis cases they're investigating are not polio cases. And even Pakistan and Afghanistan, we're down well below one percent, uh, well below one percent. But the, the two countries. Uh, between them by now, it's, it's probably 0.1 of a percent. So um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a real labour to go through this process of investigating every single case. But it it does build your confidence that uh, if you're finding paralysed kids and you're investigating them properly and you're finding that it's not polio, it does build your confidence that polio virus is not around. Great. Well, long long may that continue. And we Another question, please, or in fact, it's uh, almost a comment, but posed as a question is from Judith for you, Chris. Are you aware that the British Afghanistan Chamber of Commerce has offered to help with polio in Afghanistan? I am not aware of that and would be very happy to find out the details of that. Uh, um, okay. We, I mean, I know we are using, we are using, um, Different funds, funds from from the British government in in uh, I believe in both Pakistan and Afghanistan. But if there is if there are potential other sources, that would be wonderful. So thanks very much to Judith. Okay, fine, thank you. If I can move on to a question here, and this one is from um, Dr. Harry. And in the UK, oral polio vaccine was phased out around 15 years ago in favour of the injected variety, as the protection given is greater and much longer lasting. I'm very aware of the different social and medical circumstances, but is progress being made to use the injectable vaccine in polio free areas to prevent reimportation of wild polio from endemic areas? And I, I did go back to um, Harry and say that we were particularly focusing this evening on Afghanistan and Pakistan, but perhaps uh, you could give us an update for, for both countries in relation to the use of IPV, injectable polio vaccine. Can we start with you, Aziz? Uh, yeah. so, sorry. Yes. Um, Chris, you, you want to start, then I'll continue. Sure, as is, yeah. Um, the Harry, the, the the vaccine, the injectable vaccine, is in use in both countries at the moment. In fact, it's in use pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, still, in in over a hundred countries, it's in use as an as an adjunct to the oral vaccine. It's not the only vaccine in the schedule. The the vaccination schedules are a combination of the oral and the injectable vaccine but we're gradually moving towards a situation where the intention is globally that we would remove the oral vaccine uh, from use because because uh, um, as I was mentioning to to Janine earlier the once wild poliovirus is eradicated the only live poliovirus floating around will be those viruses in the oral vaccine when the last thing we want is for them to uh, to mutate and to turn back into you know wild type behavior so um yeah very very much so the, the injectable vaccine is in wide use but i mean it operates of course in a very different way from the oral vaccine the oral vaccine uh is a live vaccine and essentially um you know mimics it is an infection it creates an infection with a polio virus that, and that infection is what generates immunity uh, the the injectable vaccine is a killed vaccine, so it operates by generating you know antibodies antibodies directly uh, to the antigens presented on the on the the killed viruses. Um, so it, they're they're quite different in how they work. And the oral vaccine has been the one the vaccine of choice for eradication 
because of the fact that it creates good intestinal immunity as well as as uh, as humoral immunity. But of, of course, as you as you pointed out, I mean, the problem with the oral vaccine is that you have to take a number of doses and you have to take it on a regular basis to sustain that that immunity, particularly in your gut. Thank you, Chris. Um, is there anything you want yeah, to add? I would just add, you know, that IPV is not a replacement of OPV. Most of the countries which stop transmission, they then switched over from OPV and did the round of IPV. So, you know, till the virus is circulating, we will need to continue with OPV. Thanks. Thank you. And, and Nigel, I think that answers your question about why can't we switch to IV now, IPV now. They, they really do have different uses and uh, different reasons for using them. So we do need the OPV to carry on at the moment. Um, as is, can I talk about a, a rotary question a little more? Um, I have gone back to Bill and said that this will be part of a question for a future webinar focused more internally on Rotary Matters. But I be, um, would welcome your perspective, both as an endowment and major gift advisor, a Rotarian, and what your fellow Rotarians in Pakistan feel. Mm -hmm. This is uh, from, from Bill, who says that he's been involved in supporting Polio Plus since day one, as well as the Rotary Foundation. I believe the challenge, especially for smaller clubs and Rotarians with limited financial assets, is not being able to support the polio campaign and the Rotary Foundation at the same time. Whilst not in financial terms, I, should be, I believe there should be some way that Rotarians and clubs should not be penalised, he puts in quotes, so not penalised directly, if they choose polio and not the Rotary Foundation. Is that something you're aware of in Pakistan as being an issue yeah, as is? I would say that in Pakistan and in the other countries of 6B, we have substantial support for polio plus their occasions to give to annual fund because the annual fund builds up their reserves to do global grants. But at the same time, like last year in 6B, we did almost $4.5 million. And I would say that one third of that went to Polio Plus. So when 1.5 million went to Polio Plus, with the one is to two matching of Bill Gates, that became 4.5. So the rotarians of the zone where the virus is active are fully endorsing that polio program should be supported. And I would tell you that in Pakistan, I get so many texts which say that the whole amount should go to polio plus. Some say that 50% to polio and 50% to annual giving, but then there are Rotarians who want to give 100% to polio plus. Thank you. It sounds like it's a, a question and a, a discussion that is an ongoing one worldwide. But as far as my own personal view is concerned is the Rotary Polio story is such a powerful one. We should be using it to engage with our communities, to engage with our local media, our regional media, and raising that money with the public. And if we get good at doing that, we should also be telling them a bit more about Rotary and some of the projects that we're all doing locally and internationally using money from our Rotary Foundation and helping to raise money for our foundation through that awareness as well. But uh, this is about Chris and as is, not my views. So I'll move quickly on to a question from Eve. Can polio ever be eradicated whilst there is turmoil in the world? 
in place, places like Syria, the Middle East, Asia, parts of Africa, etc. Who wants to take that one first? Well, that's that's a that's a, that's a biggie. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, look, I think that uh, that's something that's on the top of our uh, top of our minds all the time. As I'm I'm sure you know, Aziz has a great deal of experience with trying to uh, negotiate around uh, conflict situations and and. Uh, security compromised situations um, and so do I over, over the years. Uh, what we can say though is that that in, in many of these settings we've ended up being extraordinarily successful in getting around it and uh, you know we've had uh, two outbreaks of polio in Syria since 2013 uh, one of which spread into Iraq 2013-2014 spread into Iraq um, we've had outbreaks of polio in Somalia in 2013, and then again 2013, 2014, and then again uh, most recent, just recently. And in all of these situations, and previous outbreaks in Yemen and and uh, other um, pretty pretty unstable and conflict affected places, we have managed to put together programs that stop the outbreak and and bring things back under control. And largely that's due to the tremendous courage of, uh, of local people who become involved in the outbreak response, health workers, volunteers, uh, you name it, people from all sides of the, of the conflicts in these places who recognise that polio is a, is a threat uh, and they want to get rid of it again. They don't want their country to be, to be uh, reinfected or to, to become... Uh, um, classified as endemic. Uh, once again, they want to keep it out. So they they make a great uh, uh, great deal of effort and great sacrifices to make sure that it's gone. Um, in in Afghanistan is probably the the only well, it is the only situation left in which we have a, a country where we are on a day to day basis struggling with uh, the issues of reaching children. To eradicate polio, to eradicate the disease, we're, we're still doing it in some other places to protect them from reintroduction. But we don't have polio there anymore, so it's it's uh, Afghanistan that we're really we're really up against it in terms of of trying to reach children consistently. Um, so it's not an issue that's gone away, um, uh, as I'm sure as is will agree. It's not an issue that's that's a, a small issue. It's a very big issue for us, but it is an issue that that the program has a program and the partners have successfully been able to to cope with up until now. Uh, what do you think, Aziz? Am I, am, am I being fair or have I been too optimistic? I want to endorse what Chris has said and let me take you back for a minute, 21 years back to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka had the LTT and LTT at that time was such a strong militant group and the only militant group in the world which had its own army, navy and the air force. But the good thing about it was it had only one leader and that was Prabhakaran. Rotary took the initiative of asking Prabhakaran by sending a fax to him that can we have an embargo on fighting and killing during the NIDs? And he was an educated person. He replied, we have no objection. Ask the Sri Lankan army. And that's how we used to do the NIDs on both sides on the areas controlled by LTT and the remaining Sri Lanka, synchronizing the activities and uh, audio was eradicated in Sri Lanka when the fighting with the LTT was going on. There are countries like that uh, in Africa, where we have been successful, 
And in Pakistan, I would say that we have come a long way, although we do not have one leader of the militants like Prabhakaran was, here, unfortunately, when you travel 50 miles, you find another leader. So that's a bigger challenge. We have overcome that. Look at Nigeria. In Nigeria also, Boko Haram is still active. And they, in the north, they have given a difficult time. But we are almost done in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, we should have been done in Nigeria long back. So if we can do it in Nigeria, where Boko Haram can kidnap 300 girls and go away, and if we can eradicate polio in Nigeria, we should be able to eradicate polio in Pakistan and Afghanistan also. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz, and, and thank you for reminding us how important the work that has been done by Rotarians and others in negotiating peace for the polio campaign. I think we all underplay and under-realize how significant that has been. So thank you, Aziz, for what you have done personally and in recognition of so many others that have been involved. Um, I'd just like to um, put a question from Bill. In both countries, do they still not understand and accept the benefit of vaccination? Or is that, is that a too wide a statement? Is it just in small areas? Basically, it's about understanding by the locals of the importance and need for the vaccinations. They, I would say that they understand, but at times, you know, the, the lesson is learned too late. There are so many incident cases where I've come across where they regret, they repent, but that happens a little too late. Um, we hope that it will not be repeated and we will be able to sail across. It is not that they are ignorant. They know that there is no cure for disease like polio. There is only prevention. It's a simple method. And uh, it is just giving two drops in every round till we can stop transmission. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Chris? Um, yeah, Jenny, I mean, I think that that's, that Aziz is, is spot on. I think that mostly people understand the value of uh, vaccination and they understand that it's something that is intended to be protective for their health. Um, I do think, though, that there is a difference between those countries where, and those areas, in fact, within countries where there is a tradition of delivering a service and those in which there's not. Um, so, for example, in, in, in Syria and Iraq, despite the fact that there were terrible wars going on and we had a number of, of vaccinators and supervisors killed trying to run immunization campaigns there. Um, despite those conditions, there was a very strong demand for immunization in the population because they had a very a very long-standing um, tradition of of a strong public health service that uh, offered a service to all families uh, was equitable etc and so that habit just didn't didn't go didn't fall apart didn't go away there was still there was still this uh, uh, very very powerful powerful demand, which was a great help for us in, in stopping the outbreaks. And if you look at it, the situation in Pakistan, if you look, say, somewhere like Punjab, the province of Punjab, where there is a strong service delivery platform and a tradition of public health services being, being delivered to people, there is also a pretty good demand for immunization because, because people understand that, yes, it's going to be there when they when they go for it. Um, the places where it's weakest are places like Baluchistan, where there is the weakest uh, public health delivery capacity and, and people really have not 
you know they hadn't had that service before so they're not they don't um they don't have it ingrained in them that this is a service that they're supposed to receive it's good you know it's a, it's a, when people are offering the service they're offering it out of a sense of, of public good and it's not there's not some untoward motive in it etc uh, that that um that could be uh, uh uh you know detrimental to them so i i think that it goes a bit both ways it's not just the knowledge of the the knowledge of the people and the families about the potential benefits of immunization i think it's also how comfortable they are with with that uh, that tradition of service delivery and that that uh, capacity to access immunisation when they need it. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I'm very conscious of time. Um, we've had a lot of questions. I've got two more on the screen, one short one and one slightly longer one. If we could limit that now to those last two questions. So please don't put any more at the moment. And um, uh, if I can put the first one to you, Chris, hopefully it's something you know, um, but if not, I'm sure we, you will find out for us or I can find out. How long did smallpox vaccination continue after it was declared eradicated? John would like to know, please. Not very long, John. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember the exact period, but it, it, it wasn't... Um, it was stopped from general general use uh, relatively relatively quickly. The certification process for smallpox was not too long winded a process. Where it was where it was sustained for extended periods of time were was in certain countries' um, militaries, um, and in particular, the United States was still vaccinating uh, for quite a long time, vaccinating their soldiers for quite a long time following the certification of the eradication of smallpox. Um, in fact, the reason that 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 that, uh, that um, immunization with smallpox vaccine stopped was the was the the uh, the development of uh, of HIV and HIV infections when of course people who are vaccinated with smallpox vaccine who are infected with HIV tended to develop um, um, pretty severe smallpox. So the the use of the vaccine then even in the military was discontinued. Sorry, okay, that was a bit I... rambling. I was I was stretching back into my memory for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, it actually does lead into the the final question, and this is from Cordo, who says he's hopeful that polio would be eradicated, and as a polio sufferer and as a clinician, would like the virus to be wiped out from the globe. How do we make sure no country will store top stockpiles of wild polio virus post eradication, like smallpox? I think that might be one for you again, Chris. <laughs> I mean, the, the main reason for anyone to store to you know to store uh, polio virus is is as a either for economic reasons. I mean, if you're still making uh, polio vaccine, particularly the 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 killed vaccine, which is of course going to be in use for um, for a while, as I said, following following eradication. Um, you know, if you're a manufacturer of killed vaccine, you need to have you need to have seed virus uh, to produce the virus that you make your vaccine out of. Um, so that's a that's probably the main reason why people would keep it. Otherwise, there are some laboratories in in the past that have used polioviruses as um, as research aids, if you like, uh, not that they may be so particularly interested in poliovirus itself, but they may be using poliovirus for particular um, uh, attributes that poliovirus has that that assists their their viral research. So what what the global program is doing at the moment is is going through a process of um, uh, what's called, you know, it's a viral containment process. Essentially, we are trying to map where poliovirus is being held, who's holding it, for, for what particular reasons, and explaining to country by country that, um, you know, once poliovirus is eradicated, if you're a laboratory that wants to hang on to polio, you're going to have to do it under very, very high containment conditions. So it's going to be a very difficult thing for any country to individually to be able to do any laboratory individually to be able to do so the only places that will be able to do it are places 
I think that have a very good reason for 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 wanting to hold on to virus or a very good economic imperative. So a vaccine manufacturer, for example, would be prepared to to go through the very very expensive process of ensuring uh, that high level of containment for polio virus uh, in order to be able to continue to store and use the virus. But again, I would say you know the ultimate our ultimate aim is to is to have that stop as well. I mean, hopefully we will uh, we will in the not too distant future be able to stop all immunisation against polio, and that would make any holding of polio virus redundant. I mean, it's not a very effective biological weapon. That's one um, one good uh, one advantage with it. There are there are many <laughs> there are many other viruses that are far more effective biological weapons than than polio viruses. So it's it's probably less attractive to hold on to in that respect as well. And it, you know it can easily be a two edged sword if you're trying to contain that virus in your laboratory and it gets out into your own population. Then uh, that's uh, that's obviously not what you want to have happen with a biological weapon. So uh, we're, we're trying to make sure as much as we can that laboratories will not store polio virus and that we'll be in a situation where, where, we, won't, where we won't be like smallpox where people are keeping, uh, keeping virus in laboratories for an extended period after eradication in the wild. Thank you, Chris. Uh, before I bring it to a close, is, any, is there anything that either of of you panelists, Chris and, and Aziz, wish to add at all? I think that Chris has said everything, and as I mentioned to you, that uh, earlier also, that eradication of smallpox and polio are two different games. And those who are more interested in smallpox, they should uh, take out time to read the book called House on Fire, written by. Dr. Bill Feige, who used to be the chairman of CDC and was very much instrumental in eradication of smallpox in the year 1969. So I hope that uh, uh, what Chris and I have said that we will be able to overcome the transmission of virus and we will have a world free of polio soon. Thank you. Thank you, Is this uh, Chris, is there anything you'd like to add? Actually, I would, Janine. I'd just like to, to say very briefly, um, you know, I'm not a Rotarian, but it's been one of the one of the great privileges of my life while working on polio eradication to to meet and work with uh, a, a large number of Rotarians who've been involved in polio eradication out of their their own conviction that they're doing something that is uh, that's good and that they've been doing it you know with with no uh, financial reward other than you know and and, and no uh, uh, quite often financial investment in fact quite often they've been they've been spending their money on trying to eradicate polio. Um, I've been honoured to meet people like Aziz, who has committed a huge amount of his time and energy to eradicating polio from Afghanistan in a, in a purely voluntary capacity. And, and there are many, many others I could, I could uh, name who I believe have, have contributed, uh, you know, as, as strongly as uh, Aziz has to the, the global eradication effort. So I, I'd just like to, to tell all our listeners how um, how uh, impressed I am by Rotary International and how grateful I am that I've had the opportunity to work with so many Rotarians over the last uh, 25 years. Thank you, Chris. So, like, one um, comment I'd like to make is it's about time you joined Rotary. But um, moving on from that, uh, I won't issue the poll. I'm conscious about time, but I will add it to a, a survey that uh, I will send you a follow-up email in about a week's time which will have a short survey in it. So if you could uh, answer that, it would really help with planning going forward. I um, would also like to say a huge thank you. Thank you to everybody that's taken the time uh, to be with us this evening. A very big thank you to Chris and Aziz for your truly valuable input. And I've had several people typing in the question box, making particular comments on how informative that they have found it and to thank you from them as well. Um, please, to those of you listening, 
I'm available at any time to contact about any polio, particularly purple polio fundraising side of things. Don't forget there are lots of other people within the Rotary that can help and support. You've got your District 10 Polio Now champions, your District Foundation chairs. Each zone has got a, a Rotary Foundation appointed N Polio Now coordinator. And there's Judith Diamond who gives us uh, input on what we should and shouldn't be doing in relation to advocacy, as well as, of course, the, the foundation teams in your own clubs and at a regional and international level as well. So lots of support there. But please, please, please don't forget the Rotary story is a truly compelling one. We should all be really proud of it and we should be shouting about it from the rooftops. Please carry on telling that Rotary polio story. Engage with your politicians, the media and the public of all ages on an ongoing basis and do so in interesting and varied ways because you can use it to help you with membership drives, raising awareness about your club's own activities and also helping to ensure that when we end up with a polio free world, people think about Rotary. Let's remember that we need to keep telling them and telling them and telling them. So Aziz and Chris, thank you so much. I'm sorry for the mix up about time and I do hope you manage to get a good night's sleep before your early start. And thank you to everybody else that's uh, been listening in and goodbye.